Beijing is the heart of China. Or rather, Jing Dezhen is the heart of China. China, if you're referring to porcelain. This ceramics capital has been the center of activity for production of porcelain since the Ming Dynasty, from the 14th to the 17th century. Come with me on this journey through the ceramics capital, Jing Dezhen, China in China. Welcome to Travelog. I'm Yin. Situated in northeast Jiangxi province, Jing Dezhen is the homeland of porcelain. It crouches on the south of the Yangtze River, and its porcelain history dates to the Han Dynasty, almost 2,000 years ago. The original name was Xinping Town, then Changnan Town, because of its location in the south of the Chang River. In the Jingde period of the Song Dynasty, from 1004 to 1007, Emperor Zhen Song decreed that the town would produce all the porcelain of the imperial court and bear the inscription, made in the reign of Jingde. From then on, people called such porcelain the porcelain of Jingde Zhen. In the Yuan Dynasty from 1279 to 1368, the famous kiln locations of the northern Song were mostly destroyed during warfare. It was only the remote Jingdezhen that escaped chaos. There, investment and advancement in porcelain ensued. Porcelain development also spread as the Mongolian rulers of China at the time were strong and engaged in trade with foreign countries. They amazed others with the beautifully elegant, fine white porcelain as they took them across the arduous Silk Road to the Middle East and slowly to other countries as gifts. At the same time, Middle Eastern fashion and style entered China and influenced Jing Dezhen's porcelain. The result was the beautiful blue and white porcelain. Jing Dezhen porcelain reached its peak in the Ming Dynasty, when the emperor sent court officials to supervise porcelain production and travel around the world. Zheng He, a famous Chinese navigator in the 15th century, traveled seven times to as far as Africa, bringing large amounts of silk and Jing Dezhen porcelain. At the time, Europeans still used coarse tableware, and the porcelain they laid eyes on became luxury items of the wealthy. The price of China's porcelain virtually passed that of gold, and Europeans referred to it as white gold. The British thus decided to call it China, associating it with the mysterious country. Dongbu village near mountain Gaolian serves as the perfect location for the origin of porcelain. It's rich in natural resources. The mountains provide kaolin clay, the trees provide the firewood, the waters are mixed with the kaolin clay and allow the resources to be shipped to other places around the world. From the tops of the mountains, the resources, the clay and the ceramics are wheeled to the docks by a stone path, which is marked with the erosion created by one-wheeled carts. Such is the path from kaolin to porcelain. All aboard the ship! Well, maybe they didn't have big ships back then, but still, this is a mini port. And this is how kaolin from the tops of the mountains would be transported to other cities and places of porcelain production. Thus, it's our main means of transportation and of huge historical significance. Today's old docks look nothing like the docks of the past. You'll see villagers washing clothes by the water instead of people loading the large number of trade ships. Now, this busy scene no longer exists. Instead, Dongbu village has quieted down. But take a close look and you will see the footsteps history has left behind.
The famous Dongbu Street lies on the bottom of the Gaolin Mountain, an important business center in the ancient times. Stone tablets date from the Qing Dynasty, and the old commercial center still contains some old shops. Kowlin is a fine, usually white clay, formed by the weathering of aluminous materials. In 1712, a French missionary introduced the term Kowlin to the world, and then a German translated it into Kowlin, according to the Chinese word Gaolin, or high hill. Unbelievable. I can imagine the workers carrying this kaolin from this mountain out there. You might feel like you're Indiana Jones if you're inside this kaolin mountain. And although the entrance is really small, it seems like this part gets wider and wider. I can almost stand up straight. See that? And the kaolin, although it looks solid, if you touch it, it sort of just crumbles off like that really easily. Can you imagine? This is the beginning of porcelain. It's from the tops of the mountains that kaolin starts its miraculous journey. Kaolin was discovered in the Yuan Dynasty and has been used ever since in porcelain production. Its properties allow it to improve ceramic producing technologies. Although what we see here has a long way to go, in the end, what we get is the magnificent, magnificent ceramic. You can spot the importance of porcelain's past in Jing Dezhen's old village. Here, local villagers still live in history. Just from these old alleys' names, references to kilns and porcelain are made. And neither are ceramics far from sight. In the Ming Dynasty, almost all families had private kilns to make their own ceramics and the leftover ceramics are used in walls and in architecture. Strolling the old street, it seems like pushing open any wooden door, you'll find hidden kilns buried in history. You can find plenty of these twisting alleyways because they were all built around the kiln. And it was like the center of activity because plenty of porcelain makers would get around the kiln and make their porcelain. Nowadays, not too many people make porcelain anymore, but every once in a while, you'll still find a few people working with their porcelain. Following the path, I was brought to a small shop. On the roofs, it seems like there were hundreds of bowls lined up. They were exactly the same. These ceramics are all made by hand, and you can even witness their production one by one. Using traditional tools, the craftsmen show us exactly how ancient ceramics were made. Porcelain works its way into people's lives in sometimes unique ways. You see these bricks here? Well, they were actually taken from the kiln site. Maybe after a year of usage, they'd be good no more. And people would lug them back and build their houses with these bricks. And the construction seems pretty simple, but because of architectural techniques, they're really, really sturdy. These have been around for maybe 
hundreds of years. Sometimes when we study history, we end up seeing a very blurry line between the present and the past. Under the sun, you might only see bricks and buildings, but one step further into the darkness, and you just might see the flames of the kiln come alive. The burning flames of the kilns flash day and night, and a French missionary was so surprised to see such a sight and wrote, At daytime, the kiln smoke in the clouds was so high. In the evening, the kiln fire lights up the sky. Longzhu Pavilion was constructed on the top of the Zhu Mountain. During 1639, the imperial porcelain factories were established in this area, and the imperial porcelain factory became the representative building of Jing Dezhen. The pavilion models the official kilns during the Ming and the Qing dynasties. The ceramics made for the emperors followed strict standards. Only perfect pieces were allowed in the palace. No flaw was tolerated. As a result, perhaps only one piece out of 100 would be selected. Many common themes on these pieces are dragons and court life. The pieces for the emperors would be marked with the characters that established the period in which it was made. Well, and as for the others that didn't make it into the palace, they would not be passed to commoners. Their